So let's start this session without wasting any time and without waiting for anybody. कितना लोड हो गया कितने प्रेजेंटेशन आ गए कितने हैं इस सेशन में ये तो सब स्पीकर ही बैठा हुआ है यार चार एक पांच और जो एक ऑडियंस है एक एक घंटे का सेशन है और हम लोग कितने हैं हम लोग हैं मुझे मिला गया पांच है ना तो कितना हो गया Uh, वैसे तो छः छः मिनट है तो सात आठ मिनट हो सकता है ना भाई नहीं 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 नहीं, 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 नहीं मुझे नहीं बोलना है मैं तो बहुत बेसिक चीज़ बताऊंगा अरे क्या कर दिया यार ये दूसरे का दिखा रहा है डिस्टर्ब ले रहे हो सो लेट्स स्टार्ट दिस सेशन विदाउट वेस्टिंग एनी टाइम एंड विदाउट वेटिंग फॉर एनी बडी बेसिक थिंग्स आई मीन दैट जस्टेशनल एज एंड द बर्थ वेट If I tell you th there is a baby in the nursery, huh? No volume, ठीक है. If a if a baby uh, suppose is 28 weeker baby, and uh, the birth weight is uh, 100 grams, so what you will think? What will come to your mind? नहीं नहीं वो तो आरोपी तो होगा ही. हाँ 100 gram नहीं sorry 1000 gram. I am sorry, extremely sorry. One thousand gram and twenty-eight weaker child. So, the automatically in your mind you start thinking that this baby is definitely number one, definitely going to have ROP. Number two, this baby uh, most likely will require some surgery, some kind of treatment. Either it is a uh, you know a kind of a laser or anti VEGF. depending upon what kind of picture is there so what i am saying presenting is karo bhai karo to mera presentation lagao to sahi to this is one what i have done is i have scored you know done the scoring like if there is a baby say up to 28 weeks or 28 weeks to say 30 uh, 30 weeks 30 weeks to 36 weeks so what is the risk how much risk is there for the development of rop and similarly for birth weight if the birth weight is say less than 800 grams if the birth weight is less than 1000 grams if the birth weight is less than 1500 grams and the birth weight is less than 2000 how much is the risk if you combine the two then what is the probability of rop development of rop either Uh, rop of uh, you know a kind of a treatable rop or rop which is a very severe rop so what that's what you are going to present but unfortunately itna to time hi le lo yaar to fir 6 minutes ka to presentation hi hai tum log aisa karoge to kaise hoga ye kahan gaya ab usko harmans harmans nagpal ko bula usi ka naive bhi hai nahi to harmans ji hamare sath mein the abhi thoda volume kam karo yaar iska volume zyada hai अरे हरबंस नागपाल को बुलाओ यही तो था वो सो दैट इज व्हाट इज अ वेरी सिंपल असेसमेंट सपोज समबडी इज इन अ वेरी प्राइमरी हेल्थ सेंटर एंड देयर इज अ प्री मेच्योर बेबी द बेबी कम्स टू यू कैन यू समवे और अदर टेल दैट दिस बेबी हैज आरओपी और समथिंग लाइक दैट है Obviously, you have to look into the eyes, yar. How can you do that? Bolo, boy, Sat Prakash. Ha, of course, low birth weight you already have. Like birth weight and gestational age, you have. You have. yes he he is right in a way that if there is a baby whose birth weight and gestational age is available 
say the birth weight is 28 weeks and gestational, sorry, birth weight is uh, 1000 grams or 800 grams and the gestational age is say uh, 30 weeks, right? So if there is nothing and if these two things are there, as he said, you want to, you are, you want to dilate, but you can't dilate it because it's, it's not dilating. You look for the anterior chamber, if the anterior chamber is shallow, if you can look into, you know, iris, and if you find new vascularization is there, these are all indication that this baby is definitely going to have uh, ROP and most likely a kind of a severe ROP. Uh, so, uh, yes? Four hundred grams. Oh. Gestational age. Calculate. Yes, that's that's what I have done. Yeah, I have uh, scored the risk factors: zero, one, two, three, for gestational age; zero, one, two, three, for birth weight, and then combined the two, and then seen the risk factor. See, the basically what it is, no, very simple in ROP, if you know the gestational age and birth weight, your mind starts thinking, you know, what kind of uh, ROP is going to be there, whether it's blinding ROP, is it treatable ROP, you, you, that you will get it, uh, you know, uh, there is absolutely no problem. So, uh, you know, from the pre prediction point of view, I mean, uh, you can, you know, jolly well guess that this baby is going to have this thing. Somebody says baby is around 1,600 grams and is a 34 weaker child. This means that this child is most likely, unlikely to, uh, unlikely to uh, have a retinopathy of prematurity. So these are the factors. This is what we can visualize. So almost what I should say is 150 degrees of re peripheral retina is not visualized on a standard fundus camera. This is what you see on a con conventional fundus camera. This is what you see on a ETDRS. That's all. While this is what you see on a white field, which is about 160 degrees and ultra white field, you see almost to the aura serrata. So more than 150 degrees of retina was missed on standard fundus cameras. And so let us see through this few case series what exactly we, are, we were missing upon. So I will just come to a few of the examples of those. I mean, not... Uh, so let us look at how it can be used or can add to our information in cases of diabetic retinopathy. Now look at this clinical example. This is a fundus photo uh, of 45 degrees and you done. You can hardly see the uh, few NVEs and look at this white field uh, angiogram. Now you can see how elaborate is the capillary dropout. You can actually see the NVEs which was not seen by standard fundus camera. And then you can target your tre treatment to the areas which are showing only capillary non-perfusion. That is called a targeted treatment. Now look at another case of retinal vein occlusion. Here you can see this is what maximum you see on a standard fundus photograph while on a ETDRS this is what you see. Here you can actually see the sclerosed vessel and look at the angiogram and here you can actually see which areas you are having a capillary dropout. You can also correlate it with the new vessels and based on that you can treat. Now this is a very good example when we started uh, utilizing this camera. He was a pulmonologist of our town. He was being treated by us for a case of a uh, uh, RVO with macular edema. I will just run through this case for want of time. And this is what used to happen. We used to treat him with multiple anti vegfs And in spite of anti vegfs it was recurring on and off. At that point, we had this white field angiogram and we did a white field angiogram and we could see the peripheral dropout much more ahead of equator. Usually, the standard teaching in a vascular retinopathy is to treat from the uh, vascular arcade up to the equator. But here you can see the ischemic areas are much more beyond that and so what we decided to do was to do in a targeted area uh, only treatment that is red area so you can spare the posterior pole of the retina which is also contributing to a field of vision and this is what is one month later so what we learnt was recurrent macular edemas in macular in any vascular retinopathies you should suspect a peripheral uh, uh, dropouts and if you do a ultra wide field angiography you can pick up the peripheral area you treat it and then the load of number of injections which is needed will be eliminated. 
Now this is another case 67 years old male who complained of decreased vision and this was diagnosed as macular edema and advised anti vegf Well this was the picture done el uh, elsewhere. When we did a white field angiogram we realized that the edema the cavities are not restricted only to the foveal but it is pro proceeding much up to the periphery. So it was a case of a retinoschisis with cyst over there. So this was no longer a case of macular edema and if you do an angiogram you could see there were some telangiectetic vessels which could be treated adequately with laser and once we treated it adequately especially in the right eye you see the telangiectetic vessels which we could never pick with a standard. So just doing a targeted peripheral laser in that area in the temporal area the edema also subsided okay. I do not have a marker because my screen is not working. Now this is another case where you can see this was case who, which was diagnosed and posted for vitrectomy with a epiretinal membrane for an epiretinal membrane. So what we did was standard photograph and we could realize that there was a vascular response, vascular tortuosity and it was a case of f a familial FEVR what we should call and so we had to do lasers also in a vitreomacular traction usually relief of the traction by just simply peeling of the membrane is not sufficient in a case of a FEVR. Now look at another case, this patient had, uh, this was the patient who was diagnosed elsewhere to have partial RD, we thought we are seeing something fibrous tissue in the periphery in the other eye as well and this is another case of a FEVR which we could never pick up with our standard fundus cameras because this disease is predominantly located in the peripheral part. So even the right eye of this patient was needing a laser treatment, when we treat an adequate laser treatment naturally we could prevent what a inevitable thing is that the proliferation in vascular tissue proliferating into fibrous tissue and leading to a detachment as it had happened in the left eye. So this is post off of the uh, say other eye which we had done. Now this is another case of a 47 years old male and he was complaining of decreased vision, he had a macular edema and look at this picture on a white field photograph, you could see multiple scleros vessel. And this is what later on when we did this white field angiogram shows the extensive dropout and when we further investigated he had a carotid uh, occlusive disease which also needed treatment and we could avoid by, uh, inevitable uh, rather I should say a death or a ca any episode ca uh, neurological episodes. So this is what it happens how additional information can save. This is another case you can see multiple scleros vessel in a young patient diagnosed elsewhere as, as Eels disease and he had a macular hole. So this is what we did again a case of you can see almost a half zone disease in an elderly male. He again had a uh, cardiac issues when we investigated him further and then his proper systemic management uh, we could prevent him from one of the catastrophe. This is 26 years old female diagnosed elsewhere as a choroiditis with macular edema and we thought we have, uh, when we did a white field photograph we knew it was choroiditis. So and it was seemed to be adequately treated but when we did an angiogram uh, sorry you could see the vascular response in the periphery yeah, the phlebitis component on an angiogram which meant he, this patient further needed a steroids just looking at the posterior pole lesions of a choroiditis was not sufficient enough and this is how this helps you. Another case this girl was present uh, combined uh, diagnosed as elsewhere as combined RD and was advised vitreous surgery in the right eye. And this is what we did, this was the right eye, this was the left eye and we thought we are seeing something abnormal in the periphery so we did an angiogram and this is a classic case of tachyosis disease. This particular is a cover page of ophthalmology journal and we take a privilege, a pride, great pride in sharing with you that it came as a cover page of ophthalmology. So this is tachyosis disease. So looking at the periphery for vascular responses like this definitely adds you. Another case of a patient who had a thysical eye following VR surgery in right eye. She came to us uh, with a history uh, for a routine evaluation, she wanted something to be done in right eye. We thought we are seeing something not proper, some vascular tumors in the periphery and you see this is what I uh, we could pick up on an angiogram, multiple vascular tumors in the periphery. So the case was a case of a angiomas, multiple angiomas, a classic case of von Hippelindo which you can never pick on a standard fundus photograph and so we treated her, uh, her with triple freeze throw and cryotherapy. this is post treatment follow up 
and importantly we asked for father to get the examination done and you see the father also had similar angiomas even the brother had an angioma asymptomatic brother had multiple angiomas which we treated and in such cases now there is a family strong family history we went for a genetics pattern and we could see the genetic uh, 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 tree we could uh, uh, eliminate and we could identify the gene which was happening and in such cases white field angiogram just pre treatment and also yearly is mandatory because this angioma lesions keep on uh, creeping up one or the other thing another case i think i will just wrap up with this particular case this patient had a diagnosed as a case of a macular edema we did a white field angiogram and we could see this was a case of a peripheral pcv okay and you can see an uh, a white field oct through the peripheral lesion you can actually do the oct even through this and you can actually assess how it responds to you this are white field IC icg and this are pre treatment post treatment follow ups on an oct which is showing the peripheral lesion coming down so with this i will just wrap up because we have n number of cases but for want of time i will just wrap it up here definitely it has come in a big way white field angiogram gives you an information of 150 degrees of retina which was invisible to standard fundus camera use a etdrs technology or whatever technique and this is why in all an explain in uh, uh, cases where you cannot explain properly if you are suspecting ischemia white field angiography should be suggested thank you and uh, now uh, yes we do yes we do we do at least in a macular edema if you see localized edema long time back yeah but this is seeing a because that time we didn't have the way to really understand where was the cnp areas now we the previous understanding of vascular retinopathy was pan retinal photocoagulation we will do from the vascular arcade up to equator now when we do white field angio we are seeing if, if the ischemia goes even beyond the equator so we even now do up to the ora serrata so this is how the understanding is Uh, in a case of a macular edema, as I just showed you, in a case of a retinal vein occlusion, that is one of the cases where we yes, it did not need further. We were missing upon that peripheral ischemic area zone. Yes, for us. in every case whenever a, any patient any vascular retinopathy for us ffa and oct are mandatory primary investigations and once we see we will be loving to treat it no primary modality will be if it is csme minimal cnp areas not seeing nvd nvs well we will not treat it but if it is a recurrent thing which is happening we would love to treat even in the absence of new vessels exactly hmm? so now it's turn for uh, i have Dr. Vishal Agrawal, who will be speaking upon uh, tips and tricks of nucleus management. Thank you, Prashant sir. Thank you, Veer sir, for having me here. I'll I was told uh, that the target audience will be comprehensive ophthalmologists, so I'll be presenting a very basic uh, presentation. Uh, PCR management uh, guidelines. So, as we all know, cataract surgery is one of the most successful surgeries with better equipment, less operating time, and decreased healing time. But despite the above fact, uh, side-threatening complications do occur even in the best of hands. <coughs> so there is a long list of complications which can hap happen uh, during cataract surgery but we will be concentrating this presentation to vitreous loss and dislocated nuclear fragments iol dislocation so 5 uh, to 7% of cataract surgeries are complicated by vitreous loss and anterior vitrectomy is an essential skill of today's cataract surgeon and it can occur in any case so to decrease the anxiety and improve the outcomes all surgeons should be well prepared to recognize and manage vitreous prolapse a uh, few signs and symptoms you all know a bright and red reflex uh, movement of lenticular particles away from the probe difficulty aspirating lenticular particles pupillary distortion are the telltale signs of a pcr so what to do do not panic 
uh, you stop the fake emulsification, do not let the AC collapse, maintain the irrigation of BSS till you inject a dispersive viscoelastic and then you remove the FACO tip and gently raise the nuclear fragments above the iris plane. Please do not fish, do not go inside the vitreous cavity with your hand piece because it's not meant to cut, it's meant to emulsify. Do not uh, you know, insert a wire vectus into the vitreous cavity, it will invariably lead to complications and maybe retinal tears. <coughs> Do not use a wick. If you have a vitrectomy system, use that for uh, vitreous cutting because the area you're operating on is very near to the vitreous base and the tensile strength of the vitreous base is less than of the posterior retina. So very commonly giant retinal tears or tears at the posterior edge of the vitreous base do occur because of these fishing attempts and uh, vitreous uh, traction. And of course, everybody should familiarize with the available instrumentation. Normally, the cutters are available in the OT, but we do not know how to, you know, set the machine up. And it, you know, uh, we tend to lose precious time. So, uh, besides you, your OT scrub team should also know where the anterior vitrectomy kit is physically kept, how the tubings are to be connected, what settings have to be used. Uh, so, the general summary of the parameters is that you have, uh, whatever machine you have, you use the highest possible cutting rate to minimize the vitreoretinal traction and the lowest effective aspiration. And if possible, you uh, remove the infusion and the infusion and the cutting should be separate because if it is into one uh, you know, system, it will cause a lot of turbulence and may lead to more prolapse. <coughs> so the goal is to remove all vitreous from the interior chamber, ensure that no vitreous is there in the incision and side port. And it can be done through the pass plane and that is the best physiological space to do a vitrectomy if you are well versed with the technique. And then if possible, if there is the adequate support, you securely place an intraocular lens. <coughs> So uh, coming to some videos, uh, so if you have a PCR and mostly we are all operating uh, you know, under topical anesthesia, the first thing is that now the surgery uh, time is uh, you know, prolonged. So you just have to you know, augment the block and a very simple way of doing it is just to uh, give a posterior septinan uh, anesthetic and it jams the eye for 30 minutes to one hour and the patient will be comfortable and the anxiety of the surgeon will be less. You just make a small nick in <coughs> the fornix just insert a blunt uh, bent cannula and inject gently uh, the anesthetic, local anesthetic. Trocar insertion. It's very simple. Uh, you first go around uh, 30 degree to the sclera tangentially till the hub and then you go perpendicular to the sclera. Just be aware that you have to be around 3.4 to uh, 3.5 to 4 mm from the limbus. Don't exceed that. Check your instruments because these trocars you are not using very frequently. As you can see in this video, the tip was bent and you have to be very careful because if it's a blunt instrument, blunt uh, trocar or a bent trocar, it can lead to retinal dialysis while insertion. So it should be sharp, preferably a new one while you are attempting anterior vitrectomy from the pass planar route. When you are attempting a pass planar vitrectomy, just hold it inside. Do not, you know, rotate the probe and uh, it will automatically come, uh, the vitreous will come into the port and when you remove the uh, vitreous cutter, do not be in a haste because as you can see, while cutting and while aspiration, the cutter was removed and it, it took up the part of the posterior capsule. So that should not be done because your uh, remaining uh, capsular support will be lost and you might not be able to put an intraocular lens after that. Of course, if the nucleus is inside the vitreous cavity or beyond your reach, then of course you tie a suture and refer a friend. So drop nucleus, the incidence is low, 0.3 to 1%. Uh, excellent results are possible if managed rationally and in time. It's ideal to remove in the same sitting if a VR backup is available, which, but uh, that is seldom possible. And uh, other factors which you know tend to delay the surgery are corneal edema, increased IOP and vitritis. Pushing for early surgery to a, uh, for a VR surgeon is not a good idea. Let him decide when to remove the nucleus after a PCR and a drop nucleus. It's a routine surgery, we make three ports, 2R25 or 23 gauge. The third port is a MVR entry because uh, we insert a fragmentome which is a 20 gauge instrument, uh, 23 gauge instrument. <coughs> and this is a soft nucleus and as you can see multiple bites have been taken by the FACO emulsification. We remove the vitreous, we uh, do a routine FACO emulsification inside the vitreous cavity by an instrument known as fragmentome which is a larger tip than the hand, a normal uh, FACO hand piece. And after that, uh, uh, we inject some tricot, trimsulone acetonide, and induce a PVD because, uh, you know, <coughs> if you don't induce a PVD, it might contract in the later post-operative period, lead to ERS, macula pucker, 
and troubling floaters for the patient. So a complete vitrectomy with PVD induction, with, phaco uh, with phaco fragmentation is the ideal way to manage a dropped nucleus. <coughs> Sometimes the hyaloid is very adherent, so you have to use a forceps and a cutter in a, com uh, in a combined way to induce the PVD. Here the hyaloid comes up and then the vitrectomy is complete. You check for the periphery for any tears and you close it. So this video is just to show you that uh, what we normally have, uh, you know, think that it's a hard nucleus and it won't be able to uh, be amenable to be, you know, phacoemulsified in the vitreous cavity. This is a coloboma uh, case, a dropped nucleus. You can see it's a cataract, uh, it's a cataract nigra. It's uh, as hard as it gets, you know. And uh, the modern instrumentation is capable of, you know, even emulsifying these nucleuses very safely inside the vitreous cavity. So if you just leave the case there, just tie a suture and refer, the results are excellent. Don't try to fish out these hard nucleuses from the interior chamber. Of course, if it's a dropped nucleus, uh, dropped IOL, you tend, you know, you just hold it with the end gras uh, grasping forceps, bring it into the interior chamber. The, uh, the point here I want to make is that the, uh, if you have a limited support and if there is a PCR and the interior capsule is also torn at some places, you have to know the deficit and you have to place the IOL oblique to it. As you can see, the fellow here is placing the IOL in the same area as the defect is. So that way the IOL is very unstable and it goes again. in the vitreous cavity. So you have to judge where the adequate support is and put the IOL 90 degrees to that. I'll skip this part. <coughs> of course, the best way, uh, the best place for a sulcus is a three-piece IOL and that is the most physiological space for a three-piece IOL. And you should all know how to, you know, the, the younger surgeon, how to load, it's a bit tricky, but you will know it uh, with practice, how to load and inject a three-piece IOL. So the last uh, video is uh, what uh, happens if you aggressively fish out the, and go after the nucleus once it has dropped. This is a dropped nucleus. The surgeon tried to you know, retrieve it. And in that process, there was a giant retinal tear. Intraoperatively, we found the nucleus to be subretinal in space. And uh, we retrieved the nucleus, attached the retina, placed the intraocular lens. But you know and uh, everybody knows that these eyes have a poor prognosis even if there is an attached retina in the post-operative period because of so much manipulation. One more case, IOL drop. Uh, it could have been a simple surgery, just tying a suture and referring it, but there was a lot of fishing. And what happened was there was an anomalous PVD. And that anomalous PVD, unphysiological PVD, caused a lot of tears in the periphery. So after IOL removal, we saw so many tears in the periphery. We lasered them, put some gas, and the patient did fine. So no fishing. Just if you think that it has gone beyond your reach, you just refer it to your VR colleague. Thank you so much. Though I had loaded it before my session. Uh, A very good afternoon. Uh, I'm very thankful to AIOS and VRSI for giving me this opportunity. I'll be presenting three very straightforward, simple cases which appeared simple to me. 
with a straightforward diagnosis and management, on only that the visual prognosis, uh, the vision which we got at the end of the day was not very favorable and that is why I put it here. So my first case was an 82 year old female patient, uh, wife of a retired politician uh, and that, thus the stakes were high. She complained of diminution of vision in the right eye for one month, known hypertensive for 10 years, controlled with medications. There was no cardiac history, there was no history of fever and there was no COVID history. So this was the uh, right eye fundus uh, picture with the uh, mild uh, uh, tortuosity of the vessels and blood hemorrhages in the macula. Vision was poor, counting fingers of 2 meters. Left eye vision was 6 by 18. On OCT, there was this uh, uh, massive subretinal fluid and convoluted uh, outer and inter inner retinal layers and uh, retinal inflammation. Uh, I diagnosed this case as macular BRVO and gave an uh, injection eccentrics in the right eye. This is the left eye and the left eye OCT was normal. But to my dismay, when the patient came to me after 15 days, there was this uh, large clumping of cotton wool spots in the peripapillary area and the macula. And uh, now uh, uh, dot and blot hemorrhages that appeared in the whole fundus resembling an ischemic CRVO kind of a picture. Though on OCT, the uh, edema had uh, disappeared and the fluid had vanished, but the vision was not very good and the patient was very unhappy. So the FFA at this, pitch, uh, this stage showed uh, uh, patchy hypofluorescent areas with the leakage from the uh, capillaries. And if you see close, closely in the inferotemporal arcade, there was a non-perfusion of the, of the vessel here. Uh, the octa also didn't uh, uh, reveal much of ischemia. There was a little bit of uh, patchy dropouts in the right eye and uh, left eye was absolutely normal. So, uh, I did a peripheral blood profile at this stage, which was normal. Character Doppler was normal. Her cardiac state was perfectly all right. Uh, since there was nothing else that I could think of, the patient was started on systemic steroids after a consultation with physician because I thought it was inflammatory. And uh, uh, at the end of two months, the foveal contour was reasonably all right, but the, and the vision had improved marginally to 6 by 60. Uh, but, uh, the, the, you know, we had not reached the end of the road yet. Uh, then the patient went to Delhi and she received two more injections of eccentrics, but uh, the vision did not uh, regain. So what could this be? Was it a post-fever retinitis? Was it, a, was it a viral retinitis? Ischemic CRVO was most likely uh, because the vision was poor, but there was no visual recovery after anti agents. And was it CRVO, but uh, there was no cherry red spot or macular whitening? and no gross macular ischemia on FFA or Octa. So basically, I think it was just bad luck and a lot of macular ischemia which caused loss of vision. So this was uh, my case two was a 65-year-old male patient, hypertensive with a no history of hyperlipidemia, no cardiac history. Vision in the right eye was counting finger three meters and you see this blood and thunder type of appearance of the retina, a lot of cotton wool spots again uh, indicating ischemia. Massive uh, uh, subretinal fluid on uh, OCT in the right eye. And uh, again, I gave this patient, of, uh, uh, I gave this patient in injection eccentrics. And after two injections, you see that there was this uh, uh, fibrinous ring-like ring exudate in the macular area. And that had caused the vision not to, be, uh, not to recover uh, completely as, I'd, I, as I'd, I, I had imagined. So this was the uh, OCT. The fluid had resolved. The foveal contour was reasonable, but the vision was not very good. And I attributed it to, to this fibrinous uh, ring-like exudate. This is the picture in the left eye. And my third case was a 55-year-old female patient, known hypertensive, history of uh, ischemic heart disease three years ago, no history of diabetes. And she, uh, she, was, she had increased LDL levels and she was on lip pass. This is the picture in the right eye, fundus. This is the OCT, which was normal. This is the left eye. You see this, uh, again, blood and thunder appearance, ischemic CRVO, some pre-retinal hemorrhage in the inferior arcade. And, uh, if you see cl closely, there were some sclerosis vessels in the inferotemporal quadrant as well as in the uh, uh, foveal area. Uh, on o OCT, there was uh, diffuse retinal inflammation, subretinal fluid, uh, intraretinal uh, fluid cystic spaces. And uh, I gave her eccentrics, but uh, you know, again to my dismay, uh, the vision on the contrary had dropped by one line and what I could see now after one month was this occurrence of hard exudate uh, clumps in the macular area with hemorrhages. This is the red free picture and this is the uh, OCT, the fluid had vanished but the vision had actually dropped. So I came across an article where uh, uh, they, they had also uh, experienced these cases. There was aggravation of retinal hard exudates after intravital anti agents for cystoid macular edema. 
and uh, uh, they, uh, they postulated that CMV with subretinal fluid is associated with a higher risk of heart exudate progression. And the two factors which were important here was that the, that the long duration CME and high LDL levels are identified as risk factors for heart exudate progression following anti VEGF treatment. And this is over and above what you already know that when there is rapid transgression of fluid in these cases, the heart exudates can appear. And they also studied that in BRVO cases did better than uh, the DR cases because in uh, DR there is also the uh, bre breakdown of the outer blood, uh, blood retinal barrier. So points for discussion here, we know that in ischemic CRVO in the first hand uh, cases we don't do an FFA but in my cases do you think that FFA was mandatory uh, and we should have done it? Should OCTA would, uh, be considered in all cases before giving an anti of uh, just to rule out macular ischemia and then, uh, uh, you know, because we don't want to pull a long face after we give anti of injections. And predictors, if any, for the occurrence of heart exudates following anti of injection and what precautions we can take for the same. Thank you so much for your patient and uh, hearing and if there are any suggestions or how could I have gone about, I'll be happy to... I think just bad luck yeah. or <laughs> sometimes. But yes, for us, uh, any cases of uh, in our vascular retinal therapy, FFF and OCP is mandatory now. But uh, I think we have next week the Dr. Shinji. Thank you so much. Happy here. That's <laughs> a <laughs> 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 
मेरा भी रनिंग हाँ चल On the outset, I would like to thank VRSI team and AIOC to for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts on post-operative endophthalmitis. This is predominantly a surgical presentation uh, in which I have adapted it for anterior segments of the knee as well. So as we know, the classification of post-operative can be cl classified into fulminant, acute, subacute, and chronic or late post-operative endophthalmitis. Uh, just to summarize, it's, we can say that if the still the anti uh, intravitreal antibiotics are the first line of management and for fulminant and uh, if you have a fulminant end of thalmitis that is presenting within two to three days within two to three days you have to just go for newer generation antibiotics because pseudomonas is one of the main culprits or staph audience so you just go for piperacillin tazobactam or imipenem rather than sticking to the vancomycin and septa and for the rest you can go for an empirical treatment and whenever you go for internet that is Venco plus Sefta, then you also do a vitreous tap and ward vitreous biopsy, whichever is available to you. And then you do a microbiological profiling and as well as antibiotic resistance to guide you in the future treatment if there is not an adequate response. So if you have an adequate, inadequate response, you go, your treatment is guided by the vitreous tap and the vitreous biopsy that you have done. Now, the main, uh, one of the main is what is the role of surgery? Now the, the EVS which proposed surgery is around 27 years back which I've done and it's concluded that vitrectomy is of no benefit if the vision is better than the perception of light or uh, but then it's around 27 years back and we have evolved a lot during that time regarding the small gauge of surgery, wide field viewing systems and the frequent use of silicon oils and currently in our practice vitrectomy plays a great role in management of all post-operative endophthalmitis and uh, the friend study which was published in 2005 which is around 17 years back it definitely concluded that vitrectomy for even for uh, patient presenting with bet, uh, uh, good vision can be uh, can have a better post-operative outcome than uh, than as proposed by the EVS. What is the timing of surgery? The in case of fulminant endophthalmitis, I would say that it should be as soon as possible. And if you have a patient of an acute endophthalmitis, you give one dose of antibiotic and if the patient is not responding, you do a vitrectomy as soon as possible. Or in case of an inadequate response, post two dose of intravitreal antibiotic, you give it, do it again. And in case of, of suspected fungal endophthalmitis, just go for it and also plan for an IOL explantation if required. It is not moving. Use not over. So, just to uh, I, I emphasize that sometimes even the eyes might look very ominous, but then we might have a good outcome. In this case, the patient almost was going into a pan of like picture, and we still wanted to take up the patient. In my, uh, in my opinion, uh, in cases of such poor visualization, I do go for an AC maintainer. AC maintainer gives me a lot of space for mm -hmm. manipulation in the anterior chamber, as well as it gives a complete uh, stability of the anterior chamber. And to all the persons, I mean, apart, uh, there is a complete transduration of fluid through the uh, John use towards the procedure chamber, and you don't need to create a third port for introducing. No, but then there is a okay. caveat with AC maintainer that if you have an un, uh, up an IOL which is uh, which is not stable, it might go down. So you have to put to talk to your uh, referring surgeon that whether the IOL was placed or whether there was a PCR intraoperatively. After you have put the AC maintainer, the now another point that, that is required is that uh, whether should you do a PVD or yeah. not in a case of endophthalmitis. Well, the previous understanding is that, that we should not go for uh, a PVD, but I think that Maradin has shifted a lot. We do go for an extensive vitrectomy and we don't just get uh, uh, stop at 
code vitrectomy. And in this case also, as you see that uh, we, d even in such advanced cases, we do go for an induction of PVD, but then we have to be very careful and it has to be done in with your experience because there might be foci where their vitreous can be very dense, uh, very, uh, very de uh, uh, adherent to the retina. In this case, when we did a induce a PVD, we could see that there is uh, some macro abscess and this obviously guards the prognosis uh, for a future outcome. And uh, whenever you are inducing a PVD, you do have to look whether where are the points of foci of attachments. And once uh, you feel that when you are doing it, you just stop there and don't try to, you know, be uh, very uh, enthusiastic of doing a PVD. So in this case, we see that after doing inducing a PVD, there is a macro abscess which is sitting, and this will eventually guard the prognosis of outcome. Now, this second case, although what it, what it tries to emphasize is that although the signs might be very ominous but the outcome might be very good. In this case, if we feel that the, almost everything is lost, there is a large superior exudate and, uh, and with some uh, scleral infiltration as well as corneal infiltration. And once we remove that corneal infiltration and uh, we, they, there's a descent view, and the surprise here is that once you go enter into the posterior chamber, the posterior chamber is, has minimal inflammation. And this is where the role of ultrasound also comes into role as it helps us to prognosticate the ca these cases also. Now this is another case in which we can easily say that the, the operating surgeon has done uh, done um, a small incision cataract surgery. And I think most of this thing could have been avoided if a well-placed suture was put. This patient also had a coexistent choroidal detachment. And so this patient has a choroidal detachment with a leaky wound as well as, uh, as, well as the endophthalmitis. And this is why we have to do a, 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 deta a drainage of the serous choroid. Uh, and that is where we have to do a very extensive ultrasound before proceeding for the surgery. This is another case. These days, okay, okay. Just these days, we are uh, dealing with premium IOS, and we certainly will encounter patients who have intraoperative endophthalmitis with premium IOS. And in this, the tolerance for going for surgery should be as soon as possible. And even though the eye might look quite weak, uh, in the end, this patient is really have a, a very good outcome. Then we have a case of patient in which we have a dropped IOL along with intra, um, along with endophthalmitis. So we have to take care that uh, whenever there is a complicated cases, and just to summarize, because we are looking, I don't know, there is a case of delayed onset endophthalmitis or late IOL. It is not acute endophthalmitis. It is caused by low virulence bacteria and fungi sequestered and isolated in the capsule bag after protect and are protected by a biofilm on the IOS. Uh, so it is not generally not very effective even if you intravitreal antibiotics. And almost 70% of cases are counted by proprietary acne or fungal species. And this is the film which is encountered and secreted around the capsule bag. And uh, or there are multiple op treatment options available, but the la lower four are the most effective one. And if you sue at the lowest, the lowest recurrence is when you go combine the treatment with PPB with the total capsulectomy as well as IOL explantation. Uh, there is definitely a strong case for IOL capsular bag removal. And what we must do is that delayed onset is not accurate. So many of cases we present that we keep on in, uh, having recurrent inflammation and the treating surgeons are just putting restroids after steroids. So we have to counsel our patient for IOL explantation. So, in the end, I would just like to conclude. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for giving us 10 minutes more. So the prevalence in Indian and Western population of the AMD is not much different. And the five specific factors which are implicated as a risk factors, and out of these, two are the modifiable, like hypertension and the smoking. 
FFA has not a much role in cases of dry AMD, but it, it is used to pick up the conversion of a dry AMD into wet AMD and also in the subtyping of the uh, CNVM into subfovial, extrafovial or juxtafovial lesion. ICG is better up in picking up the occult CNVM and the feeder vessels and you can either see a hotspot or plugs. OCT, besides in diagnosing and the follow-up cases, it helps in monitoring and the prognostication of such cases. In dry MD, you see the RPE bumps and geographic atrophy, while in wet MD, PED with fluids, CNVM, membranes or the break in the Brooks membrane is seen. If you see pachychoroid spectrum, double layer sign, the bubble sign, notched PED or thumb-like PEDs, then you should suspect the PCV in such cases. The other prognostic factors or which are called as the OCT biomarkers in AMD are the, uh, the subretinal fluid, RPTS and the layer retraction, pre-choroidal clefts, the photoreceptor degeneration and the subretinal foci. Fundus autofluorescence, it reads the health of the RP and it is seen that if there is increased autofluorescence in 500 micrometer margin around the areas of geographic atrophy, there are more chances of progression. It is seen as a unilobular or as a multilobular pattern. Octa identifies the loss of the chorio capillaries under the geographic autrophic area. And in wet AMD, it picks up the type of the CNVMs like type 1. The vessels radiates in all directions from a large main feeder vessel. In type 2, it is the lesion which connect to a larger feeder vessel. And in type 3, it is tub shaped high flow vascular network arising from a deep capillary plexus. It also tells us whether the CNVM is active, which shows the pattern of C fan or Medusa head. And if it is a chronic lesion, long filaments are seen, while in an inactive disease, it is a dead tree pattern. Retro mode, another modality, it reads the health of the RPE. It is superior to FAF and the color photo because it picks up the unhealthy RP in the form of the vesicles and the extent of the disease is seen, uh, is seen very much high. So coming to the genetic study, if you have a member with a family history of AMD, you are at risk of three times and the most commonly associated gene is the Y402H. So why the genetic studies are done? To see the response to the various treatments like antioxidants and intravitreals. ARIDS 1, 2 and then the new ARIDS 2 formulation. They concluded that the role of the antioxidants is there only in the intermediate stage. Lampalizumab was another addition which was taken after the phase 3 trial because it does not reduce the enlargement of the geographic atrophy as was claimed. So prevention and follow-up is equally important in such cases. Coming to the treatment of wet AMD, from feeder vessel laser photocoagulation to the photodynamic therapy and now the pharmacotherapy, we have n number of antivegifs in our basket and the latest addition is the brolucizumab. But knocking the door is the new drug that is the ferisumab which is needing approval from the FDA. So dosing strategies, we all are aware, it is monthly basis, PRN basis, and the treat and extend. But the basic uh, drawback is the non-response, which occurs because of the tachyphylaxis. And to tackle the, rem uh, the remedies for the tachyphylaxis are, you can increase the dose of the molecule, or you can switch front of the antivages, like from a lo lower molecule to a better molecule, or even in some cases, it is seen that switching back of the antivegifs helps out in taking care of the tachyphylaxis phenomena. Now, repeated injection is another uh, fear which is there with all the uh, vitroretinal surgeons. So it can be taken care by the port delivery system, which you need to refill once or twice a year. The other in phase 2 and phase 3 trials are the double punch and the longer lasting antivegifs. Gene therapy is in a way to come and if it comes, it will be a one and done treatment and which can use to treat the disease. But the basic disadvantage is the price cost. So to, not only we need to treat the patient, follow up and rehabilitation of such patients is equally important as they are visually challenged. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Uh, kindly open this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening, all of you. I'm going to talk on management of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. We all know that any abnormal vessel in the retina, either in the form of neovascularization at the disc, elsewhere, preretinal hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage, or tractional detachment is classified as proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Actually, the classic form of diabetic retinopathy, there are two things which lead to diminution of vision or loss of vision. The most common cause of loss or defective vision is diabetic macular edema, but the most common cause of massive loss of vision or profound loss of vision is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And so we need to take care of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. As we all know that the world is moving fastly towards uh, massive population load of diabetic people and almost 27% of diabetics are having at least any sort of DR and out of those 27 percent around 1.4 percent can have proliferative diabetic retinopathy so that extrapolates into a very high population burden of d proliferative diabetic retinopathy it is a, a disease which involves multi-organ and so multidisciplinary approach is required to manage the diabetic retinopathy in proliferative form laser remains the gold standard till date and laser pan retinal photocoagulation is done to treat the proliferative diabetic retinopathy as we all know that it is uh, done in either two to three sitting and whole retina is lasered except two dd away from the optic nerve and macula outside the arcade till the periphery visible and generally it takes two to three months to regress all the neovascularization or hemorrhage in 60 to 70 percent cases with good diabetic control rest may continue to bleed and uh, so new vessels formation and then we have to uh, resort to other treatments like anti-VEGF or surgery is required. The recent studies have shown that intravitreal injections of anti-VEGF molecule is also non-inferior to laser uh, treatment photocoagulation with added advantage of preserving the peripheral visual field. Protocol is of DRCR.net have classically shown that intravitreal monthly doses of ranibizumab leads to regression of neovascularization with preservation of the peripheral visual field. Another studies like Proteus and Pride also showed the similarly that anti-VGF either alone or along with laser can gives us a better outcome as compared to laser alone. These are the head-to-head -head comparison of anti-VGF versus PRP. Sometimes vitrectomy is needed if the patient is having vitreous hemorrhage which is not resol resolving or there is tractional detachment or NVG with vitreous hemorrhage then definitely we have to operate such patients and to do that surgery nowadays we are having very advanced equipments like micro incision vitrectomy system. This is a case of um, a mild traction with persistent vitreous hemorrhage. A 27 gauze uh, MIVS surgery was done to this patient. The vitreous hemorrhage was nicely cleared out. And the advantage of doing MIVS is that the tip of the instrument is very small and it acts like a cutter or scissor as well. So we do not need to change the instrument again and again with a single cutter we can do almost whole the surgery that saves a lot of time and the risk of complication and all is also very less. The outcome is very good. The healing and post-operative recovery is also very good. And this kind of patient fare very well after doing micro incision vitrectomy rather than older days vitrectomy like 20 days. Nowadays 20 days is very less commonly done but 23 days is still being done but uh, results of 25 and 27 is relatively better as these surgeries are having sutureless and very fast recovery and the patient does very well in such cases. Uh, another case of uh, this tractional membranes in a case of diabetic which pulls the retina there is a uh, massive vitreous hemorrhage and traction and folding of the retina detachment or traction over the macula as well so th this surgery was done with 25 gauze three port pass plan of vitrectomy the posterior highlight was lifted gently in uh, while inducing pvd in uh, diabetics we have to be very careful because if we give a very high traction or pull uh, uh, not so carefully that can cause massive bleeding traction, traction detachment because there are a lot of focal uh, adhesion over the retina with the uh, posterior highlight. So we can lift little bit, we can cut and we can release the traction and then we can again lift and progress uh, likewise till periphery. After removing all the vitreous, we can close all the bleeders by doing 
diathermy, indo diathermy, removing the blood, and we can do a laser to all the left leftover areas. And if a patient is having traction or some break, iatrogenic break or detachment, or the retina keeps on bleeding, then we can put some gas or silicon oil as well. Uh, at the end of surgery, sometimes we need to inject anti VEGF also. By this way, we can clear and we can find a, a healthy retina and the outcome can be better. So this way, if we, if we manage multimodality diabetic retinopathy, the outcomes are good. So laser, anti-VGF and MIVS vitrectomy have recently changed the uh, scenario and outcome in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And if a patient comes to us on time and screen properly and management is done properly, the outcome is very good in cases of proliferative diabetic retinopathy also. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the listening. So over to you now.